And now we would like to start our conference. As mentioned, today's topic is common ground, root causes of protest towards reform. As already mentioned, we're going to be looking at different forms of protest and four different issues in the four weeks. And we are mainly going to look at autocratic states. We have experts from different regions of the world with us. And um, I look very much forward to introducing the experts of today. We have with us Lara Baladi. She's an Egyptian Lebanese artist, archivist, and educator who is recognized internationally for her multidisciplinary works in photography, video, and multimedia installations. And one of her major topics is protests and revolutions. Welcome very much, Lara. We're very happy to have you here. Good to see you. And we also have with us uh, Thomas Carruthers. Uh, he's, he likes to be called Tom, he told me earlier. He's interim president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In that capacity, he oversees all the research programs at Carnegie. He's all, he also directs the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program and carries out research and writing on democracy related issues. Welcome, Tom. Um, very happy to hear, have you here. I will have uh, conversations with each of you two first, and then we'll open up for a discussion with the whole group. And let me start with you, Lara. Uh, maybe some of you, you know, are wondering why we have an artist here um, if we're talking about <laughs> protest movements. And there's a very, very good reason that we have you with us today, uh, Lara. You were one of the protesters at uh, Tahir Square in Cairo in the year 2011. And you told me earlier when we spoke that you were grappling with the events from an artist's perspective at the time and still do, and you began to archive the revolution. Can you explain to our participants what that means and how did you proceed? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for uh, this wonderful introduction. I don't know if I deserve the term of expert, but I am an artist and uh, artists have a privilege of working from, I would say, a kind of anarchist kind of space. So we don't really have a proper way of doing research. Um, each of us has his own or her own kind of approach to making art. So mine is very much based on archiving. And so when the revolution started in the Arab uh, region in 2011, and actually in 2010, to be correct, I. Uh, you know, I, I looked at everything from, uh, from, from my own space and from also being very much at the center of what was happening. So uh, I downloaded very immediately when things started, I downloaded videos, images, uh, and all kinds of data that was circulating on social media at the time. I focused on uh, virtual conversations that were happening on Facebook and Twitter, which were the main uh, social media platforms of 2011, if you remember Instagram didn't exist, for example. Uh, and I particularly focused on uh, popular language. I'm very much an artist who works with popular language. So whatever subjects I work with, I look for a kind of language that is, I wouldn't say universal, it's a bit exaggerated, but definitely common to many of us. Uh, and in this case, it was what I called Vox Populi, the voice of the people, the, you know, the standard citizen in Egypt or across the Arab region at the time, uh, which specifically emerged from Tahrir. So it really had a very new kind of tone and, and texture to it. Um, as an artist, I, um, I was at the time pretty much at the forefront of the Arabic uh, artistic scene. And so I was really specifically fascinated with what sort of took place overnight, a kind of shift in language, uh, artistic language um, that emerged and that was essentially very creative, which was uh, quite extraordinary because after 30 years of not being able to express ourselves, everybody was creating and speaking and expressing all kinds of, um, of reactions to what was happening on the ground with uh, the mediums of video, of photography, and of all kinds of other creative songs and so on. Music was actually a big part of the, um, of the moment. 
Uh, and then, uh, last but not least, uh, I what I downloaded and what I archived was uh, were um, footage or uh, images that resonated with historical uh, protests and strikes that had taken place in other historical contexts across geographies and across time. And so my archive is called Vox Populi for all those reasons. And we will provide you with a link later if you're interested to look at um, more of Lara's work. Actually, let's look at the video that you shared with us um, and then talk about it a little. Can we have the video, the brief clip that you brought with you? Oh. Take him. Every case of police brutality against a Negro follows the same pattern. They attack you. Bust you all upside your mouth and then take you to court and charge you with assault. What kind of democracy is that? What kind of uh, freedom is that? What kind of social or political system is it when a black man has no voice in court? Has no nothing on his side other than what the white man chooses to give. My brothers and sisters, we have to put a stop to this. And it will never be stopped until we stop it ourselves. Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, Laura, can you put this in context of your work that you described earlier? What did we see and what is it part of? Okay, so this was uh, one of the first pieces that I did using the archive that I collected. Uh, it's actually a video, it's a three channel video installation, which uh, is, um, which works through uh, via an algorithm um, and shuffles uh, the archive that I've collected, but uh, only keeps uh, the, the narrative, let's say the narrative never changes, but the side videos that you saw do change and do uh, vary according to the person uh, uh, watching the, 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 the piece. So uh, this was called uh, Alone Together in Media Res, um, which was influenced by uh, our relationship to the internet and specifically at the time, uh, how we all and each of us perceived this moment in history from uh, the perspective of the Google algorithm uh, and also from our location in the world. And so it was important for me that this was done through an algorithm for that matter. So the work is actually 40 minutes. It's what I call a visual commentary. Yes, and uh, when we spoke earlier, you said that, you know, after or while collecting all this material, as you described earlier, you started to see patterns in revolutions um and became more interested in this aspect what are some of the patterns that you saw and still see <laughs> so um yes the more the more i collected uh, for, well the, what triggered the collect the collecting uh, itself was that pattern uh, one pattern which was uh, a viral uh, video that uh, was shared at the very beginning of the uprising in Egypt um, and that was titled Cairo Tiananmen uh, Courage and so it was referring to uh, 1989 uh, Tiananmen Square, the tank man and actually that video was in the little clip that you saw it's the center video with the water cannon the police uh, truck water cannon that's stopping a, a protester from uh, moving forward and vice versa, actually. So, um, so that was very early on. It was actually before the twenty, before the day of anger. So it was between the twenty fifth and twenty eighth of January two thousand eleven, and um, the the this video really triggered something very emotional in me uh, because I remembered uh, nineteen eighty nine very well from watching it as a kid on television. Um, but also because I knew in that very moment that Egypt as I knew it was never going to be the way I knew it, um, which is in a way com complex and uh, complicated feeling when a revolution is starting, which at the time I want to remind everyone that things don't happen because they're planned, they kind of happen as they happen and then they become what we know 
uh, of them. But at the time when in those first few days, no one really knew what was about to take place. And so, um, and so this was a very important moment for me. It was very emotional and it also was very, very impacting. So I, uh, it, it really triggered my desire to go down to the streets, but also to collect this language that clearly was opening a door to something that was not new and that was not about Egypt, but really was about a much more profound uh, necessity, which is, I think, uh, common to all of us. And this is the, the quest for freedom. So what else did you see? Because you went down on that path, you know, you, you studied revolutions in a sense and uh, looked at the patterns and you came up with a lot of similarities over the decades I, and centuries. I'm getting a bit emotional now that I'm talking about this, which I hadn't planned, but yes, I got a bit lost, but you're right. So I'll just share... Um, let's say the overall uh, arching patterns, uh, not get into the details, I don't think we have the time for that today, um, but essentially what was interesting is that the more I worked with the archive, the more I did exhibitions, the more I, uh, the more I worked really through the archive and kind of looked at it from uh, certain filters, I started to break it down into uh, phases of revolting. And so, uh, the phase, the first phase would be the uprising phase, the moment where the social movement starts, people go to the street. Uh, the second phase is the phase of the removal of the regime, which is a phase of uh, ecstasy and uh, uh, hope and all the possibilities are lying ahead. Then there's a very short uh, phase, which is a brief, very brief political transition that tends to happen not only in Egypt, but generally speaking, which is a kind of very fragile moment in which everything is possible, but um, there's a kind of lurking of the old regime in the background that's trying to come back. And then there is the return of the old regime. Usually it's much more violent, it's much more aggressive, and it's much more controlling. And then there is uh, something in which we are now and we've been for a long time, but let's say it's, it has evolved too because things don't uh, stay uh, um, uh, the same way uh, and they keep changing. But let's say after the return of the old regime, immediately after you have the post-revolution status quo, um, which is a phase of uh, what was called in the French Revolution, the witch hunt. And uh, we also experienced this in Egypt. So a lot of uh, people suddenly falling off balconies or dying on the road or, uh, as, you know, assassinations that are either uh, uh, straight assassinations or uh, discrete, uh, supposedly, suicides of activists, political figures, etc. And that's a phase where uh, activists are usually experiencing exile and all political opposition is usually put in prison. So that phase continues, but of course, within that phase, there's a lot of subphases, or let's say evolution of, of, uh, of, you know, of momentum that is uh, that that shifts. Um, so, I, I, I can continue to talk about a couple of examples, but I think you have another question for me, maybe. I well, no, actually, give us some examples, and then I don't want to have, you know take away all the questions from our audience, but I am really interested in some of some of the examples that you can point out that you came across maybe in your archiving research and in your art. Okay, so, um, so for example, I take the moment of uh, uprising uh, and uh, look at uh, usually the kind of, I mean, there's, there's several, there's several scenarios, of course, uh, but there has been a very a clear uh, pattern that is about demand for dignity. And that's trans that translates into a, a demand for uh, removing uh, police brutality, for stopping police brutality. Uh, so uh, I'll give some examples. So usually this happens. Um, so what is the pattern here? The pattern is the death of a young citizen. Uh, who, because he is young and because he tends to be uh, uh, representing a majority of the population, will uh, most people will identify to that person and uh, every other person will go to the street 
uh, to um, as a kind of uh, response to that. Uh, and in our case in the region, uh, you, we saw a lot of martyrs that were uh, uh, really uh, the kind of starting point of the uprising. So in Egypt, it was uh, Khalid Said, who was uh, killed in the street uh, by the police in 2010. Um, and the, the Facebook page, We Are All Khalid Said, was one of the things that triggered uh, and that helped uh, gather people to go to the square on the 25th of January 2011. So other examples of this, you could say, uh, you could see, you could look at the 60s, Emmett Till, who was killed uh, and was at the beginning of the civil rights movement in the US. Uh, Neda, who was a young woman who was killed in Iran in 2009. Um, Bouazizi, who self-immolated in Tunisia in 2010, immediately before uh, Egypt's Tahrir. Um, Hamza, this little boy in Syria, who also was killed in 2011 at the beginning of the uprisings. And then, of course, in the US recently, we've seen Mike Brown in Ferguson, USA in 2014, and of course, George Floyd in 2020. So uh, you can see that the reasons are pretty similar and, the, 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 and that moment kind of opens a whole, uh, a whole set of protest and uh, demand for changes uh, on a legal, social and, and um, justice um, uh, judiciary level. Mm -hmm. And this is really um, to a few. These seem to be all triggers. Today we're talking about root causes. Is there a difference between the two from your perspective and uh, from your research and archiving? And what would they be? Because, you know, I read an article where you were quoted that it's often, as you just mentioned, the death of a young person that will trigger a lot of activity. But from my understanding, there's a lot of root causes lying behind that before that. Um, have you done some, you know, have you discovered that as a pattern as well? Um, I would say that this would be the work of a historian more than my work in a sense, because this is getting really into very specific um, sequences of events. Although making an archive is also about chronologically looking at how things evolve and picking up on uh, particular moments. Um, so, of course, uh, the root, I mean, the root causes, of course, are going to also be very much comparable from one place to the next, um, because uh, you can kind of look at them from a bigger, uh, you know, a bigger perspective and a, a more, let's say, a more generalized point. Uh, point. Uh, so, uh, for example, I just want to give an example of um, a trigger which is really not a cause um, and which is more of the drop of water that makes the, va the vase overflow. So in Lebanon in 2019, for example, the, the, the government decided or announced that they were going to tax WhatsApp messages. Of course, everybody went crazy and one woman uh, went to the street and this triggered the whole, uh, the whole uh, what we know uh, that happened after, which is a protest that lasted uh, about a year and a half, two years. Um, in Chile, it was the price of the bread. Uh, and in Tunisia, uh, Bouaziz is self-immolated because uh, he got arrested by the police and the police asked him to pay money, which he didn't have because he was selling fruits on the street and was very poor to begin with, so corruption. And so these, um, these, uh, these moments, these triggers are really about an accumulation. They just come at a point where things have accumulated to such an extent that it cannot be contained. And that's it. And one person goes out and it kind of gives the courage to everybody else to kind of also express themselves towards uh, uh, anger and uh, this discontent uh, of how the, the governments are and the state is uh, dealing with, uh, with the society. Um, what can I say else? So, um, so yeah, so the root causes are more of a long period of dissatisfaction rather than a very specific moment in time that can really be uh, five minutes, um, you know, something that's very uh, radical and like makes things change completely and immediately. Um, uh, in Egypt, uh, Mubarak was in power for 30 years. Gaddafi in Libya was in power for 42 years. You know, there's plenty of time for abuse and for uh, people to be completely fed up by the time that uh, that the moment uh, comes for revolting. 
Um, of course, history is much more interesting and complex than, than that. So there's so many sub stories that I would love to tell you because I've done so much research and, and it's also I'm passionate about the, the subject. Um, but maybe what I can invite you to, uh, to do is at some point to look at the project that I'm doing right now, which is called Anatomy of Revolution. Um, and it's still in progress, but it's an abecedary of uh, revolting, uh, sort of ABC, uh, which is some kind of guideline, manifesto, history book. Uh, it tries to visualize these patterns and these cycles through the study of iconography of protest uh, across time and space. And so um, I'm still working on it. So unfortunately, I don't really have something to show you, but uh, I'd love to talk about it more at a different time. Well, Thank maybe you. we'll have some questions later in the Q&A session. Thank you very much for the start, Lara. Very um, inspiring. And I saw some of the stuff on your website. Um, it really, really is a lot of material to go through. And um, you've done a fabulous job of gathering it. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Let's move on to uh, Tom Carruthers. Um, welcome, Tom. Um, after listening to Lara's personal and more artistic perspective, um, I mean, you look at it from an academic perspective. Are there similarities? Can you um, see a common ground between the two of you and the work you do um, concerning revolutions and protests? Definitely. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's, it's wonderful to have the chance to talk to the group. Absolutely. I do see lots of similarities. We live in an age of protest. Um, individuals around the world are angry about the governance um, that they have. And they're angry in all kinds of political regimes. They're angry in authoritarian regimes and semi-authoritarian regimes in quite a few democracies too. And we often describe the current moment politically in the world as a huge contest between autocracy on the one hand and democracy on the other. Although that's true in some ways, I think a deeper lens is that the 21st century is, is a struggle between citizens who want more and expect more and often need more and governing systems that are not providing it to them. And the real question in the 21st century is, is governance gonna be enough? Citizens are more empowered. Uh, they're empowered both by technology, but they're also empowered by education, by travel and so forth. And they're not putting up with it anymore. Um, we've been chronicling at Carnegie through our global protest tracker, protests around the world in recent years, and there's just been a steady increase. Of course, there was a pause because of COVID, but now it's back. And focusing on authoritarian regimes, but really in a sense on all kinds of regimes, we see very common patterns. There are really three or four root causes that are at the basis of most protests. And I'd correct a misapprehension that many people have, which is that most people protest because of economic conditions, because they're very poor. And, you know, nobody should have to live in abject poverty. That's actually wrong. The main driver of protests is political anger. And political anger comes from several kinds of things. It may come from a strangled election, the strangling of the citizen expression through an election. Think of Belarus, for example. It may come from the heavy hand of repression in a regime. Think of police brutality in many places and the protests they engender. It can come from political stagnation. Think of Algeria, just an endless gray politics that never seems to change and people just don't want to put it up with it anymore. Or it can come from the extension of a constitutional term like Bolivia a couple of years ago or more recently in Benin, you know, a place where uh, a leadership says, we're just going to stay in power past what the constitution says. So there's a lot of political anger out there about these kinds of things. Other big drivers of protests, root causes, as you're calling them here. The second biggest one is corruption. Citizens have really had it with corruption around the world. In the last five years, more than 10% of regimes in the world have fallen because of citizen anger over corruption. You know, if you went to the doctor and he or she said to you, you know, have a 10% chance of dying in the next five years. If you don't cure this corruption, have a give up the corruption cigarettes, you'd probably quit the cigarettes. Um, and regimes are learning that corruption is fatal to political regimes of, of all types. Um, a third big driver is just basic incompetence you know, just poor performance. Um, think of Lebanon, for example, where a government is just 
governing the country in a just haphazard and terrible fashion in many ways. And then the fourth, um, the fourth driver after that is is also a governance one, which is exclusion. It's marginalization. It isn't just poverty. It's the differential. It's the inequality, the marginalization. I feel like you just can't keep pushing us down. Laura mentioned, for example, the rising of bus and subway fares in Chile. That was, you know, a lot of people just feeling like, you know what, that's just not fair. We're already disadvantaged. We're already the class of people that get stepped on all the time. Now you just come and you know raise this on us, the common person. We're not going to put up with it anymore. So these are the four big root causes that we see. And so if you say to me, guess what, Tom? Protest has just broken out in a country X. I would say to you, I would guess it's one of these four, and probably the political driver uh, is the most likely. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You mentioned the global protest tracker at the Carnegie Endowment. Um, what was the motivation to develop this tool and what are some of the information I can get from it? Well, you know, the flood of protests is it's like you wake up every day and check the newspaper, whatever news source you use. And oh, my gosh, you know, today it was new protests in Brazil over the weekend because of the COVID response. It just seems like day after day protests keep breaking out. And I felt like, how do we keep track of this? It's just, it's hard to keep track of it all. And so a tracker, um, uh, because to understand political change, it's easy to focus on sort of elections or, you know, major events like that, but protests are actually a bigger driver of change in many places. So I thought, let's have one place where you can go, click on the tab that says active, and it will show you all the active. Now we can't get every single protest in the world because we sort of have a scale cutoff. So we try to have significant, which means ones that are really rattling the national political life of the country, not a small provincial protest that's you know very local. And so the idea is to help researchers policy people, activists in countries and journalists and others say, what really is happening? Because once you get the full picture, then you can start to extract some trends, like what are the root causes? Or how often are these protests really producing results? There's a lot of debate about, you know, are these just all kind of straw fires that burn very quickly and don't create much lasting change? Or are they really deeper processes that are producing change? So in the tracker, you can look at the outcome if you click on the country, the little plus sign next to it, you can see the outcome of the protest. What kind of change did it produce? So the idea is one place where you can get this kind of information, size, amount of violence, outcome, triggering event, underlying root cause, that kind of thing about any particular protest. And um, thank you. Um, and we'll post a link. It's already been posted. <laughs> the participants are faster than we are. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, what are some of the um, similarities in the last decade? Because I read that 2019 was the year with the most protests yet. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they happen in so many different environments, but they seem mm -hmm. to all have, you know, we've mm -hmm. talked about patterns and root causes. What is what has maybe changed um, compared to decades before that this decade, and you also mentioned it, you know, this is the age of protests. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that's changed that it's actually quite profound, it's, it's, it's this emergence of what analysts are calling leaderless protests. Now, the term leaderless has already provoked a bit of controversy in the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. The United States says, no, we're a leaderful, not leaderless movement. It's just we don't have a single leader like Martin Luther King. Um, but leaderless protests are ones that are not led by a singular figure but instead represent a kind of broader combustion among a lot of different people in which the protest is driven by a broad sense of energy. And there's no one group of what sort of one person or even a small group of people, but instead it's often quite decentralized, quite fluid, often decentralized geographically in the country, but also decentralized in the sense of who's making the decisions about when to protest, where to protest, how to protest. And these leaderless movements, I think Ute are characteristic of something deeper in the world, which is we're living at a time when all of us, we feel it in our own lives, all of us feel less attachment to many institutions than we used to, to whether it's political parties, to our governments, to labor unions, to social institutions, 
people's lives are more fragmented. We're kind of on our own a lot. And so we search horizontally through the technological means among us to create communities, to create a sense of meaning and attachment in life. But we don't do so through through carrying cards in our wallet and saying, I'm a member of this and I'm a member of that. Instead, we're creating our own identities in this way. And I think these leaderless protests are a product of a much deeper change in human life and in societies towards this kind of fragmentation of the individual experience. And that's why governing institutions are having such a hard time connecting to individuals because they're not giving them the kind of meaning and sense of belonging that individuals want. <clears throat> so I think leaderless protests cut across whether it's um, you know, the Hong Kong protests in an authoritarian state like that, which were one one example of that, to the Chilean protests in a d- democracy and others. So it doesn't it isn't a characteristic of a particular regime type. Instead, it's a broader pattern, which I think is really quite significant. So um, you expect more protests like this in the future? I do, because the technology keeps growing, the fragmentation keeps growing. And, you know, COVID put a significant pause on protests because, you know, knew everyone was locked down. But think about it. The four drivers that I mentioned of protests, COVID is affecting all of them. Uh, it's affecting governmental competence. Uh, many governments have proven themselves to be low competence. Um, Brazil is probably the most uh, sort of startling and terrible example. It's corruption. The COVID responses have involved a lot of corruption and smuggling of goods, of financial flows that are diverted for the wrong purposes. So citizens are angry about that. It has produced um, political anger on the part of people who don't agree with government responses on this or for that reason. It's increased inequality and the marginalization. And so COVID has put its terrible fingers on all four of the major drivers of protests and aggravated these conditions in many countries. And so as the COVID wave starts to recede, thankfully, in at least some parts of the world, and we hope many parts of the world over the next year, two or three, the drivers of protest have only gained force in this time. And so I think, unfortunately, unfortunately, we could talk a bit about philosophically whether protests are something to regret or something to kind of cheer on. It's a complicated answer to that. You know, we're going to see a lot more protests, I think, as a result. So we have been through an age of protests, but it hasn't ended. It just simply hit a pause, and now we're continuing in that path. Mm -hmm. You earlier mentioned one misconception about um, the root causes of protest. You know, you said that many of us think it might be the economic uh, background or the situation of people. What are some of the other misconceptions about protest movements um, that you've Mm -hmm. noticed? Another is that protests are by young people for young people. Yes, young people are very much part of protests, but so are people in their 30s and 40s, which uh, if you're my age are actually young people, but not in an objective sense. Um, And uh, protests are not just by and for young people. People, Protests are about all kinds of people. Um, And uh, and I think that's important to to note because it relates to the fact, as I'm saying, that this isn't, you know, we sort of think of protests, young people, sure, they're at university, they get angry about something, but once they get their first job, you know, they go back to normal life. This isn't about that. This is about something, you know, deeper in which people of all ages feel this sense of anger and fragmentation and lack of connection. So another, like I say, big misconception is that protests are simply by and for young people. One other misconception I'd say, there's a little bit of a dismissive tendency of some analysts to say, yeah, sure, protests, but you know, they get crushed and life goes on. And it's true. In some cases, like China has crushed the Hong Kong protest movement brutally, uh, illegitimately, uh, in my view, and with, I think, terrible consequences for Hong Kong. But that's not typical. Protests in many authoritarian countries, despite formidable odds, have produced a lot of change. Armenia is one place where there was a big regime change as a result of protests. Algeria hasn't succeeded the protesters as much as they have hoped to produce change, but the country is rattled. Sudan, protests there, has significant effect. In Venezuela, the regime never settles because of protests. We could go down the list. There are many countries that are quite authoritarian uh, who felt themselves um, shaken by protests. You know, there's a a misconception that this is sort of the age of the rising authoritarians because China's doing well, Russia's asserting itself. Most authoritarian governments are terrified of their people. 
the, the, the biggest fear of an authoritarian leader is opening the shutters of the presidential palace in the morning and looking out and seeing 10,000 or 20,000 of their citizens out there saying, we're sick of this. We're not going to take it anymore. And we're not going to go home. That is terrifying to authoritarians everywhere. And over 75% of authoritarian regimes in the last five years have experienced significant protests one type or another. Well, thank you for the start, the two different perspectives from an artist and from an academic. Mm -hmm.